Okay, let's begin by offering our respects to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. निर्विशेषून्यवादी पश्चातारिणे हे कृष्ण करुण सिंधु दीन बंधु जगत्पते गोपेश गोपिकांत राधाकांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कंचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदवनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरिप्रिय वाचकलपतरूव्य कृपा सिंधुव्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे प्लीज रिपीट आफ्टर मी ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Girvana, mira que pete algo, algo. Girvana. A ver, ayúdame. Okay, so what did we see in the previous class? We are on chapter number on two. Chapter number two. So, how many two. books have we seen so far? Uh, we have seen two point three seven. We saw from two point three onwards till. Two point seven. Two point seven. Yes, and very very significant verse we saw. in the previous class what was that karpanya dosho karpanya dosho very nice so what happens in that verse 
Uh, in that verse, uh, Arjuna is uh, surrendering to Krishna as his uh, disciple. Exactly. So it's very, very significant because that's the verse where <clears throat> Arjuna surrenders to Krishna. We saw how Krishna does not begin to um, give philosophical advice to Arjuna until he asks for it. So when we ask for it, then Krishna will give it to us. Very nice. So that's why it's considered to be the turning point of the Bhagavad Gita. Another important lesson uh, we learn from that is when one should not only ask for instructions, one must ask for education so that we can um, take important decisions in our life. And when we are dealing with our inferiors, with our children or with people we are preaching to, or if we are cultivating someone, if we are in a in a, in such a position where we have to guide someone else, then we should not only give instructions, but we have to give the education by which they can take the right decisions. So why? Because then it will help to strengthen the faith of the children or people whom we are cultivating. Just, just don't give the instruction, but give the education that is required. You know, at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, <clears throat> Krishna tells Arjuna that whatever I had to say, whatever I had to teach you, I have taught you. Now it's up to you what you want to do. Krishna tells Arjuna. So he doesn't force Arjuna to fight. So he says, Yathe chasi tatha kuru. It's up to you what you want to do. Do as you like. So we have to learn this very important instruction also from Krishna. Okay, do we have any questions before we proceed to today's class? So I welcome you all. Uh, very um, happy to see Aja. Then we have Anita. We have Bhumika, Disha. Jadwani, Disha, Melwani. Then we have Deepa, Harman, Hema, Kalpana, Karuna, Lal, Melwani, Mampi, Biswas, Meena, Bharwani, Mehik, Bakshani. Then we have N.C. Venkatchari, Neelam, Neha, Chatlani, Neenad, Mehta. Then we have Pavani, Rajan, Girdhar. He's from the land of Kurukshetra where the Bhagavad Gita was spoken. And then my parents are there. We have Rito Lalwani, Sandra. We have Shivani, Sri Hari Radha Mataji. We have Osha, Varsha Mayani, Venkatesh A. We have Lavina and we have Nisha Dadlani. So thank you very much for joining our uh, weekly classes. Okay, let's proceed to today's. Who can read today? Can I read Mataji? Yes. Thank you very much. Should I start now? No, no, one second. Hold on. We'll start with the shlokas first. Nahi prapashami mama panudyad yachoka mucho sharnam indriyanam. Avapya bhuma vasapatnam riddham rajyam suranam apichadhipatyam. Now, yes, translation. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. I can find no means to drive away this grief which is drying up my senses. I will not be able to dispel it even if I win a prosperous, unrivaled kingdom on earth with sovereignty like the demigods in heaven. Hare Krishna. So who's the speaker of this verse? Arjuna. Huh? Arjuna, yes. So Arjuna is saying that his um, senses are drying up. He says, Indriyanam, his senses are Uchosanam. It is all uh, uh, drying up. Why? Because he says that I can find no means to drive away this grief. He's so completely shattered. He's having such a emotional breakdown that he's saying that there is no means by which this grief can go away. Now, Arjuna is in a very, very exalted position. He's a, we have discussed so many times, he's a Kshatriya, he's a, he's, he belongs to the royal family. He's the most powerful warrior on earth. He's famous there. And uh, what can go wrong for him? materially he has everything going for him but still he's saying that there is no way by which I can dispel this grief and the grief is so much that his senses are being uh, drying uh, getting dried up 
And he says that I will not be able to dispel it even if I win a prosperous, unrivaled kingdom. So he's saying if I have a rajyam, a kingdom, which is rhythm, which is very, very prosperous, which is which is without any enemies, a sap, a sap, a sapatnam. So if he says that if I have a have a kingdom which is uh, prosperous and has no enemies, and a kingdom which is equal to that of the suranam, equal to that of the uh, demigods, even the devatas. If if the kingdom is so prosperous like that of a day of the devatas, even then he says that I will not be able to dispel this grief. So having this uh, king, this kingdom is like a dream-like situation for any king. Hmm? A kingdom which is prosperous, like the uh, like that those of the devatas in heaven. A kingdom which has no enemies is a is a dream situation. But he says that even such a kingdom will not be able to dispel away this grief. So as we discussed, Arjuna had everything going for him, talent, skill, health, family. So even he has um, health by his side. He's, he's skilled, he's talented. He has a very good family, devotee family. And most importantly, he has friendship with Krishna. Yet he was not able to solve a difficult situation. In the same way, we also face so many problems like illness and the recovery may be very slow in the illness or there may be a sudden death in the family. There may be a tormenting boss in the office or we have problems with our relatives, with our partners, spouse, children or parents, the work environment, tension in relationships. So like that, we, we may have so many other uh, conflicts and uh, we realize when we have such conflicts that physical comforts will not help us in such emotional conflicts. So material qualifications like wealth, beauty, fame, strength, connections, educational degrees will not help us to solve emotional conflicts. We have to have a particular solution to a particular problem. Just because one may be rich or one may be, one may belong to a very strong family or one may have beauty or uh, youth by one side or several degrees, qualifications, educational qualification doesn't mean that we can overcome emotional conflicts. For example, if I'm hungry, if I sleep on a 24 plated or a 24 uh, gold carat bed, my hunger is not going to go away. To, to solve my problem of hunger, I need to eat. So we need specific uh, solutions to specific problems. You know, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there is a story of a king. Uh, he had 10 million wives, Maharaj Prithu. He had 10 million wives, but he did not have a child from any of those wives. So he said that um, all the all the respect that I receive, all the glory that I get is like um, uh, is like I think he said receiving garlands, giving several garlands to a hungry man. So what is the use of that? So material qualifications will not help us solve the real problems of life. We discussed what are the four real problems of life in the previous class. What are they? Birth, um, old age, disease, and um, mrityu, um, death. Yes, birth, death, disease, and old age. Janma, mrityu, jara, and vyadi. So our real problems are these four. And material qualifications will not help us solve these real problems. We are like the fish out of the water. The fish, uh, his, the, the real abode of the fish is in the water. And once you take the fish out of water, no matter what you offer the fish, the fish is not going to be happy. The fish just wants to go back into the waters. So our real uh, abode is the spiritual world because we are spirit souls. We are spirit souls. So we have come from the spiritual world. And as long as we are in this material world, we are not going to be happy. We think that we will be happy by so many other means. No, I can get a better car, a better house, uh, good clothes or so many other things. Or we want that we should have good degrees, a good job, good family. I should get a good husband, good wife. But nothing is going to help us. We are going to be happy only when we go back to where we came from. The, hmm? There is no place like home, they say. no. So our home is the spiritual world. Let's go to 2.9. Sanjaya Vacha, 
ಋಷಿಕೇಶಂ ಗುಡಾಕೇಶಂತ ನಯೋಕ್ಷಿ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಉಷ್ಣೀಂ ಬೂವ Sanjay said having spoken thus Arjun chastiser of enemies told Krishna Govind I shall not fight and fell silent Hari Krishna Now Sanjay is speaking and he is uh, telling Dhritarashtra that having spoken thus see the word uktva means uh, spoke so there are two uktvas here in this verse the first uktva refers to what Arjuna has spoken thus far and the second uktva refers to what arjuna is going to say now so having spoken thus sanjay is saying then what did uh, godakesha or what did parantapa say to whom to rishikesha that govinda i will not fight so we have two names of arjuna and two names of krishna in this verse what are the two names of krishna godakesha and parantapa and govinda no two names of krishna Govindam and Gudakesha. Parantapa? Hirishikesha and Govindam. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Rishikesha and Govindam. What does the name Rishikesha mean? I think it has to do with the um, um, sen- Master Rishik- of Senses. Master, Master of, of the Senses. senses. Yes. Yeah, very nice. Master and the word senses. Govindam means? gives Attraction pleasure to senses a, gives pleasure to the senses but govinda <laughs> also has two more meanings what are they pleasure to the cows and pleasure to the land yes exactly very nice and what are the two names of arjuna we see in this verse uh, parantapa and gudakesh so gudakesh means what Conquer someone who sleep. conquers the sleep one who conquers sleep or one who conquers ignorance so one of the characteristics of a person who's in the mode of ignorance is that he likes to sleep a lot <clears throat> so ignorance is compared to sleep so arjuna has conquered sleep he has conquered ignorance therefore he is called as godakesha and parantapa means the chastiser of enemies yes the chastiser of the enemies so here again uh, sanjaya disappoints dhritarashtra by saying that arjuna will actually chastise the enemies so after saying this now arjuna has said this and he says i shall not fight now in which verse did arjuna surrender to krishna it was in 2.7 right so one may think that okay 2.7 arjuna surrendered so 2.8 krishna is going to start speaking but no krishna still is silent and arjuna has spoken two more i mean arjuna spoke one verse then sanjay is narrating so two and so here 2.8 we see arjuna continued to speak even after he surrendered because um, by doing so arjuna is showing his determination that yes i want to receive guidance from my spiritual master so krishna sees that um, how badly does he require it so arjuna shows his determination here and then we have this verse and now finally in 2.11 krishna starts to speak but again 2.10 uh, sanjay is narrating let's hear the verse tamu vacha rishi keshah prah sanniva bharat sena yoru bhayor madhye vishidanta nidam vacha Oh, descendant of Bharata, at that time, Krishna, smiling in the midst of both the armies, spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjuna. Hare Krishna. This name Bharata here refers to whom? Uh, Arjun. The, no. The gra- grandfather. Great the grandfather. Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra. Ah, Dhritarashtra. yes. It refers to Dhritarashtra because they are all descendants of uh, Bharat Maharaj, right? So here it refers to Dhritarashtra because Sanjaya is speaking this verse to Dhritarashtra. So he is telling Dhritarashtra, oh, descendant of Bharata at that time. What is Krishna doing? He is smiling. Hmm? Prahasan. Prahasan. So Krishna is smiling. When Arjuna is grief-stricken, 
So let's say somebody is crying in front of us and he's uh, so overwhelmed with grief. And if we start to smile, then it is considered good or bad? Bad. 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 Yeah, because somebody is in such a terrible situation. So the situation is very grave and very serious. So how can one smile? But why is Krishna smiling here? Is he making fun of Arjuna? Or is no, he because the grief? No, of because... No, because he's he's thinking that Arjun is a Kshatriya. How can Arjun smile is pondering over these things in the middle of the battlefield when he's ready to fight? It doesn't make any sense. And it says that how this weakness has come into you. He's just saying, this is not you. You give up this. Okay. Anybody else wants to try? Uh, I will say that Krishna knows everything. He, cre he made his mind up like this, right? To give the Gita... Uh, for everyone so he knows uh the reason behind uh, why he's confused and why he's in this state that's the reason he's smiling uh, okay. i don't know okay or because like, arjuna has surrendered to him because arjuna has surrendered to him so that makes krishna happy isn't it yes, mm -hmm. yes. that's what Prabhupada explains in the purport that um, uh, krishna is very glad that arjuna ha has done the right thing by surrendering unto him. So when we don't know what to do, we should know what to do. So Arjuna, he didn't know what to do. He was completely, um, he's on such an, he had this emotional breakdown, yes. But even in the midst of that emotional breakdown in that terrible situation, he knew exactly what he has to do. So another important lesson for us, when you don't know what to do, you should know what to do, which is to surrender to a superior authority. Surrender to Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. So yes, Krishna is glad actually that Arjuna has surrendered to him. Krishna is glad that now the friend Arjuna is now going to become a student. Krishna is glad that the battlefield is now going to convert to a classroom. So, but anyway, the smile was uh, very brief. It was a very brief smile because uh, Krishna, of course, understanding, understanding the gravity of the situation, um, it, it's not that he's smiling for uh, extended periods of time. And also, if Krishna was um, uh, enjoying the grief of Arjuna, because that happens to people no, uh, on an ordinary material platform, that some, sometimes if one is distressed, then some uh, others may enjoy the distress of another person, unfortunately. But if, if, uh, if it was that Krishna is enjoying the distress of Arjuna, then he wouldn't have spoken such profound knowledge immediately thereafter. So Krishna is smiling because his friend has become a disciple. Krishna's smiling gradually changes to a more grave expression. He will now act as Arjuna's spiritual master. And the talks between spiritual master and disciple are serious. Therefore, Krishna first smiles. This is called as Rasa Sandhi or a meeting of two different Rasas. So Rasa, we will discuss this Rasa. Friendship here gives way to parental affection, which is similar to the relationship between the guru and disciple. So relationship between guru and disciple is very much like the relationship between parents and the children. In fact, the spiritual master is called as the spiritual father. And when we get initiation from the spiritual master, that is considered our second birth. Therefore, when we receive initiation, we get a name, spiritual name from the spiritual master. Because just as how the father gives a name to the child upon birth, the spiritual master, who is a spiritual father, gives a spiritual name to the disciple who is his spiritual child. So let's try to understand this rasa. So there are five relationships or mellows which one can maintain with Krishna. It begins with Shanta rasa. Then we have Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya and Madhurya rasa. Now, as we proceed from one to five, the intimacy of the relationship increases more. So there is least intimacy in Shanta Rasa and maximum intimacy in Madhurya Rasa. So what relationship, each one of us has a Ras, has a relationship with Krishna. What is that Rasa that only we know and Krishna knows? And we don't have to reveal it to anyone. So Shanta Rasa approaches the Lord with admiration of his greatness, opulence, etc. So here, uh, one admires the greatness of the Lord, but one is not actively serving the Lord. For example, uh, the grass, 
in Goloka. See, in, in the spiritual world, everything is um, animate. Hmm? So even though there is grass, there is cows, but they're all animate. It's not, it's not like uh, the consciousness we have here in the material world. So the grass, uh, for example, admires Krishna, but the grass is not actively serving Krishna or the trees. They are not actively serving Krishna, but it so happens that let's say Krishna walks on the grass or Krishna is under the, under the tree, take, uh, under the shade of the tree, then they are uh, serving uh, Krishna, but they're not actively serving Krishna. In Dasya Ras, there is active uh, servitude, just like Hanuman. One example of Dasya Ras is Hanuman. Hanuman is actively serving Lord Ramachandra. He's always there ready at the beck and call of Lord Ramachandra to render whatever may be required. Then next we have the friendship or the um, Sakyaras, which Krishna shares with his Gopa friends. Arjuna is um, another example of Sakyaras. So there is more intimacy in friendship than there is in Dasya, uh, uh, the servant of the Lord. Now, more intimacy is there in parental affection or Vatsalaras. So here example is Yashoda. Uh, definitely Yashoda's relationship with Krishna is more intimate than Arjuna's relationship with Krishna. So there is more intimacy in the Vatsalaras, parental affection. And then the maximum intimacy is there in Madhurya Rasa, where you relate to Krishna as your paramount hmm, lover. Because one may be inappropriately dressed in front of your um, partner, but one will not be inappropriately dressed in front of your parents. So therefore, there is more intimacy in Madhura Rasa than there is in Vatsalya Rasa. So here, uh, as Srila Prabhupada explained in the previous slide we saw, Arjuna's um, Rasa is changing from friendship to Vatsalya Rasa. Because now, before he was seeing Krishna as his friend, now he's going to see Krishna as his spiritual master or spiritual father. So these are the five principal Rasas. So you can see here in Goloka, we have the gopis here with Krishna. So here what rasa is being uh, depicted? Rasya dance. No, what rasa? Madhuri, Madhuri, Madhuri. Madhurya rasa. Here he is with, who is she? This is parental. This is Yashoda. Yashoda. So parental. So what rasa is that? Vatsalya. Vatsalya. Yes. Here he is with his this, friends. This is Sakya. 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 That's Dasya. This is Dasya. And here? This is... Um, Santaras. Santaras. Very nice. Okay. Now Krishna is going to speak, right? Now in the next verse, Krishna is going to speak and he begins giving uh, Gita Gyan. Actually, Gita Gyan begins from the next verse. And it goes on till 18.66. Because after 18.66, of course, there are more verses that are spoken by Krishna. But the knowledge as such, what he wants to give to Arjuna, ends at 18.66. Now, one may ask, and usually people ask this question. When Krishna and Arjuna were deep in conversation on the battlefield, what was everyone else in the two armies doing at that point of time? So the answer is simple. They were just waiting for Krishna and Arjuna discussion to end. It's very hard to believe this, no? Because uh, our modern day concept of war is if, if there is a war-like situation and both parties are ready to fight, they just fight. If there's going to be a conversation on the opposite side, are we going to wait or are they going to wait in the modern day war for the people to finish? No, 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 they will not wait. It's not going to happen in the modern day war, isn't it? But there is a vast difference between the war. There is a vast difference in the war of the previous ages or the Mahabharata war and the modern day war times. What is that? See, let's discuss. So first of all, in the Mahabharata war or the war in the previous ages was more a test of skill and strength. The point was not just to win, but to win through a fair fight. Hmm? The point was they wanted to win through a fair fight. So it's unfair to attack an enemy when the enemy is not yet prepared for war. So these ethics and moral codes were followed in the previous ages. Date of war was decided in advance by both sides. No stealth attacks were launched. So both parties decided that, okay, war will begin on such and such a date. It's not that there was a surprise attack by one party on the other party. There were no, um, I mean, 
it was not that it was unexpected. They knew that we are going to fight on such a such a date. And location also was previously decided. They fought only in Kurukshetra, thereby preventing casualties. It was not that bombs were dropped in the cities and uh, civilians were killed, innocent people were killed. Uh, so therefore, the location also was previously decided to prevent casualties, to prevent the civilians from getting scheduled fighting only from sunrise to sunset with cordial intermingling thereafter. So therefore, these ethics were um, okay. Uh, Venkatesh Prabhu, uh, may I please request you to mute your microphone because there is disturbance. Okay, so these ethics and moral codes were fought in the wars in the previous ages. Now the question is where these codes of conduct followed in the Mahabharat war because there were some codes that were broken. So definitely initially, as long as Bhishma Dev was the commander in chief of the Kauravas, all these rules and regulations, the codes of conduct were very much followed. Okay, so when Bhishma saw that there is a conversation going on on the opposite side, he did not give uh, the order to his to his army to launch the attack. So he saw because you cannot attack an enemy when the enemy is not yet prepared for it. So therefore, when the conversation was going on, which went on for about 40 minutes, okay, this conversation between Krishna and Arjuna was for 40 minutes. The other party, they were simply waiting because the other party was not yet ready for the fight. So, in fact, this is the this was not the only incident that put the war on hold, the conversation between Krishna and Arjuna. So, the two incidents that put the war on hold, one is, yes, the Arjuna, the Krishna-Arjuna discussion. What was the other incident that put the war on hold? Does anybody know? After the conversation finished, something significant happened. Okay, let's see. Can you identify the personalities in the picture? Yes, yes. Krishna and Arjun, and it's Duryodhan and Pitama. I mean, Duryodhan and Bhishma Dev, I think. I'm not sure, but I think. Okay, Bhishma Dev is correct, but this is not Duryodhan. Oh, then it must be um, Arjun? Arjun? No. No? It must be then Dronacharya. <laughs> no. Are you going to exist, exhaust all the personality? Drishta Dumna, no. No, I think I heard Ditti say something. Did Ditti say something? Yudhishthir. Yudhishthir, yes, exactly. That's Yudhishthir. So why did Yudhishthir go to Bhishma Pitama? Who knows? To ask his permission to start the war. Ah, exactly. To ask mm. his permission, to ask his blessings before the start mm. of the war. Because Yudhishthir is so um so perfect, no? He's so he's 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 um he's so good. So Yudhishthir, even after the discussion was done and everything was um, all set, he went to the opposite side. And how did he go? He went without any arms. He went walking. He went down his chariot. He walked to the opposite side without any arms, without any protection, without any armor for his protection. And he went and seek the blessings of Bhishma Dev. And even at that time, nobody attacked Yudhishthir because he's not prepared for the war. So these were the two incidents. Not only did he go to Yudhishthir, he also went to, I'm sorry, not only did he go to Bhishma, Bhishma he also went to other personalities. Whom do you think he went to? After Dronacharya, yes, because he is his teacher. Then whom else would he have gone to? Shakuni Mama. No, hmm. not Shakuni. Dhritarashtra? No, Dhritarashtra is in Hastinapur. The war is in Kurukshetra. Oh, okay. Krishna? What's that? Krishna? No, Krishna, though, he's on his side only. Na? This is opposite side. Who's the other Acharya? Guru? 
What's that? Bro. His, his, name start, his name starts with D. Dronacharya. Dronacharya. No, Dronacharya, we already mentioned. He goes to Bhishma, he goes to Dronacharya. Then there are two more names. Kripacharya. Kripacharya, yes. And one more hmm. name, his uncle, who is a chariot driver of Karna. Who is Yudhishthira's uncle on the opposite side who was a chariot driver of Karna? Shalva. Okay. So see. Yudhishthira descended from his chariot and walked unarmed and unprotected towards Bhishma's chariot to seek his blessings, followed by those of Dronacharya, Kripacharya and Shalva. So actually Bhishma, Dronacharya and Kripacharya, they told him that if you would have not come to us to seek our blessings, we would have cursed you to lose the war. They told him that. So they actually blessed him that may you be victorious. Okay, so these are the two incidents that put the war on hold. The point is, when the enemy is unprepared, they did not attack, which is which is unthinkable for us. So that's, therefore, this question comes to our mind. Sometimes people say uh, that uh, actually this conversation never happened. How is it possible that in the middle of the war, such a long Bhagavad Gita has spoken, what was everybody else doing? Why? Because our modern day con um, concepts that we have in our mind uh, don't make us believe such things. You know? We have these... Um, uh, so much trash in our brains already, you know, so we cannot understand so many things. Okay. Anyway, so with that, we come to the end of section one. Now we will see section two. In section two, um, Krishna uh, starts to give the knowledge to Arjuna. And in this section, Krishna counteracts the first argument of Arjuna as to why he does not want to fight the war. So what was Arjuna's first reason not to fight? The, uh, the familiars and the, his mothers and all his relatives. What about them? That they like he would have to fight them and it was not correct according to him. Uh -huh. So he was feeling in one word? Compassion. 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 Yes, exactly. Compassion. So here he counters Arjuna's compassion argument. See, another uh, important point to understand Bhagavad Gita is that not once in the entire Bhagavad Gita, Krishna comes up with any of those circumstances that Arjuna has gone through, any of the injustice that Arjuna has gone through uh, on the hands of the Kauravas as to why Arjuna should fight. Not once does he mention that, okay, you they cheated you in the gambling match. They insulted your wife. They have taken away your kingdom. They have taken away all your riches. They tried to kill you in the wax house. They tried to kill your brothers, your mother. They tried to kill uh, Bhim when he was a small baby. Not even once hmm, Krishna comes up with any of the circumstantial reasons as to why Arjuna should fight the war. Because if, if he would have mentioned that, then one can argue that, okay, but I was, this did not happen to me, you know, my wife was not insulted, nobody tried to kill me or none of these things happened to me. So this message is not for me. It was only for Arjuna. It was specifically only for Arjuna, but it's not like that because Arjuna has asked for generic instructions and Krishna also gives generic um, instructions. So these are universal laws which apply to each and every one of us, irrespective of whether we are man or woman, rich, poor, Indian, American, it doesn't, uh, adult or child, it doesn't matter. These are universal principles, just like how the law of gravity is a universal law. It applies to everyone. No, nobody's an exception. So like, therefore, Gita's message is a universal principle that applies to each and every one of us. So the Gita does not contain any of the circumstantial reasons for the war before which it was spoken. Those can be found in the Mahabharata. And what it does contain is the universal principles of living and for acting dutifully, that the duty of fighting is only incidental. Here in this case, that Arjuna's duty is that he has to fight. But it teaches us that how each one of us should <clears throat> act dutifully. So 11. Shri Bhagavan Vacham Ashochyanan Vashochastvam Pragyavadamscha bhashase gata suna gata sunscha nanu shochanti pandita. The Supreme Personality of God had said, while speaking, learn words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. 
those who are wise lament neither for the living nor for the dead hari krishna so krishna begins the knowledge by first of all chastising arjuna because what is krishna saying that you are mourning for that which is not worthy of mourning and he saying that you are speaking learned words so he saying you are speaking while speaking learned words you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief so in other words he is saying that you you are talking big big things but actually what you are talking is nonsense <laughs> so that's what krishna said you are talking as though you are a, you are very learned but actually you are talking like a fool is what krishna is saying to arjuna so he begins by chastising arjuna and he is saying that those who are wise lament neither for the living nor for the uh dead those who are pandita those who are the learned people they do not lament for the living nor for the dead why what is dying the body or the soul body body is dying is the soul dying no no so therefore he is saying you are lamenting you are only on the bodily platform you are only at the bodily platform hmm? but what you are looking at they are only the bodies so he is saying you are lamenting for death but that is not worthy of lamenting because the only thing that dies is the body so he is using the word this pragnya vadan learned talk so he is saying you are talking as though the talks are learned but actually they are not worthy of lamentation so sometimes to learn we have to unlearn therefore krishna is initially chastising arjuna that what you are lamenting for is not worthy of lamentation so which means he wants him to unlearn what he has already learned sometimes when we want to teach some someone we have to first try to remove the trash in their mind that they already have only then there is going to be space for the real knowledge like if i have a jug of water and it is already filled with water and i and i pour water into the jug what is going to happen will it hold any of the water that i am pouring in no it will only overflow isn't it we have we have to first empty the jug then only we can pour fresh water so therefore sometimes to learn we have to unlearn so first step in teaching is to dismantle students misconception which may require strong words sometimes to learn we have to unlearn so krishna begins gita gyan by exposing arjuna's faulty reasoning that's the first thing that krishna is doing so one may think oh, why is krishna calling him a fool hmm? why is he why is he saying that you are speaking big big words but actually it's it makes no sense so we have to understand that god's purpose is not just to comfort us it is also to challenge us and change us so we may come across situations in our life when we feel challenged and unless we don't feel challenged we will not change unless something um because most of us are like that now we need we need a big jolt to jolt us out of our ignorance to jolt us out of our sleep so <clears throat> so therefore the spiritual master or the or the lord will come up with something um that will jolt us out of it just like how a doctor he has to treat his patient the doctor may may have the doctor will have kind words words of comfort for us but at times the doctor is also going to give us some bitter medicines sometimes the doctor is going to have to inject needles in our body which we don't like but then it has to be done for our own well being so god's purpose is not just to comfort us it is also to challenge us and to change us because whatever doesn't challenge us does not change us see challenge causes change at the start at the gita start arjuna has a particular conception of dharma the right thing to do so he has his his conception of what is right and what is wrong he thinks he should be non violent and avoid fighting against his relatives but then he realizes that if he abandons the fight he will unintentionally commit violence to his closer relatives his own brothers who will have to bear <clears throat> the brunt of the aggression thus this circumstance challenges his conception of what it means to be a good guy who does the right thing so we we will not change unless we are challenged and that's what krishna has done he has he is challenging the conceptions of arjuna that he already has see if we want to <clears throat> build muscles and we go to the gym to work out let's say we have the capacity to lift 5 kilos so if we lift less than 5 kilos will we be able to build the muscles no to build muscles we have to lift at least 5 or a little more than that so we have to challenge our own limits 
that's when we can uh, uh, build our muscles. So in the same way, even in life, unless we are not challenged, we are not going to learn or we are not going to improve. Education is not just meant for verbalization. It is meant for internalization or transformation. So what Krishna is uh, telling Arjuna here that you have only verbalized knowledge. You have knowledge. You're speaking learned words. Because Arjuna says, no, Arjuna says so many big things. He says, I have learned from disciplic succession and that there will be Varna Shankara. There will be unwanted population. They will, then he says that we will all go to hell. The ancestors will go to hell. They will fall down from the heavenly planets. So he, so, so yes, what he says is Shastrik. So, but then Krishna is saying that you have only verbalized education, but you have not internalized it because it has not transformed you. Still, you are on the bodily platform. Still, you are looking at them as the body. Still, you are only on the material platform. Another example of someone who verbalized education, but did not internalize education, did not undergo a transformation after education. Famous personality from Ramayan is... Ravan. Ravan, exactly. You know, because Ravan, mm -hmm. he, he knew all the Vedas. He knew all the Shastras. In fact, he composed some very expert poetry to glorify Lord Shiva. It's not easy to compose uh, Sanskrit verses. I mean, it requires a lot of intelligence to, to be able to do that. And he also knew all the Shastras by memory. But he only verbalized all that education. He did not internalize it. He did, it did not lead to a transformation of his heart because he still had lusty desires. And that's why he wanted to take Sita away from Ravan. He want, I'm sorry, Ram. He wanted to enjoy Sita, but he did not want Ram. In the same way, if we worship Lakshmi, but we don't worship Narayan, it's called demoniac mentality. We like to do Lakshmi Puja on Diwali, isn't it? But we don't want to worship Narayan. We want Lakshmi, but we don't want Narayan. We don't want to worship Narayan. But Lakshmi has to be worshipped always along with Narayan. You cannot have, you cannot have Lakshmi without Narayan. If you want to have Lakshmi without Narayan, then that's called demoniac mentality because that's what Ravan wanted. Ravan wanted Sita, but he did not want Ram. See, see, uh, Lakshmi by nature is chanchal. No, she doesn't stay in one place. She by nature keeps moving. Hmm? The only place where Lakshmi is fixed up is where her husband is there because Lakshmi is always by the side of Narayan. If you don't worship Narayan, then Lakshmi is not going to stay with you. She's, she just moves because by nature she's chanchal. Okay, let's go to 12. Natve vaham jatu nasam Natvam neme janadhipaha Nachai vada bhavishyamaha Sarve vayamata param Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be Hare Krishna. So here Krishna is telling Arjuna that the soul is eternal. What is he saying? Never was there a time when I did not exist. So Krishna is saying that he has always existed in the past. There was never a time when he did not exist. Na tva evaham. Nor you. Na tvam. Nor you. So there was never a time when even you did not exist. Hmm? Then he's talking about Janadipaha. All these... Um, all these people, all these kings also, there was never a time when they did not exist. So the soul has always existed in the past. There was never a time when we did not exist. Then he says, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So there will never be a time in the future when we will not exist. So we have always existed and we will always continue to exist. It's just that the bodies are changing. Currently, we are in this particular body. In the previous lifetime, we were in some other body. In the next lifetime, we may be in some other body. So what happens when we go to the spiritual world? In the spiritual world, do we still have a body? Yes, we have a spiritual body, our sarup, our real sarup. Uh, in the spiritual world, also we have the body, but we have a spiritual body. We not do not have this material body. What is the difference between a material body and a spiritual body? Uh, material body deteriorates and it's changeable and it's temporary and spiritual body, our sarup is not, it doesn't deteriorate, it's not changeable and it's not temporary, it's a natan and it's internal and it is all good, spiritualized. Okay, very nice. Any, anybody else wants to answer? 
what is the difference between a material body and a spiritual body spiritual body is always sachin anand always sachit ananda yes sachit ananda what do those three words mean what does sat mean the truth sat means it is eternal oh it means okay chit means knowledge Heart. knowledge full of knowledge so there is no there is no ignorance there is no trace of any ignorance in a spiritual body and then ananda happiness happiness, happiness. Transcendental, Always, happiness. transcendental happiness so so do we have do we have that kind of happiness in the material world do we have happiness in the material world no no is no we just have a illusion of happiness illusion temporary happiness where mind thinks to be happy but actually in reality there isn't any happiness yeah there are like, moments when they we may be happy like uh, sri shila prabhupad gave the example that the happiness in the material world is is uh, very brief it's just like if somebody holds a man and puts him in the water and he's struggling for breath and then he brings him up for a moment and then he takes one breath and then again he pushes him in the water so you know that one moment of breath that he gets of happiness that's the kind of happiness we have in the material world but then uh, it's not ever increasing but uh, happiness or bliss in the spiritual world is ever increasing bliss so there is everything is very blissful and that bliss also is always increasing it's not even at the same level so that's the kind of happiness in the spiritual world so yes we don't have birth death disease and old age we are eternal um, spirit souls in the spiritual world there is no birth death disease and old age and we are even here we are eternal spirit souls just that the soul is covered by the material body now how many kinds of material bodies exist i mean three sukshma right sukshma and then uh, uh sukshma and um, there and the other one is um um the one that we see in the mirror the one that we do, we do not see the mind and the body and then the the I, i'm i'm not getting the name but okay anybody else wants to try the soul has two coverings stool stool sukshma and stool right okay give me the english sukshma oh, is a gross body. body gross body gross body gross gross body and other is subtle body subtle, subtle body yes. subtle body. body exactly gross body and subtle body so what is a subtle body false ego mind intelligence yeah uh, mind intelligence and false ego that is the subtle body and what is a gross body made up of of the five elements of the five elements so what we see in the mirror is gross body or subtle body we see the gross, gross body. body the gross body exactly what we see in the mirror is the gross body now at death what happens what leaves the body soul leaves the body soul, the gro- oh yeah the soul leaves the body and what happens to the gross body the gross body gets burned it gets changed we get another one <laughs> and what happens to the subtle body the body enters another body the subtle body enters another body no. and when is the subtle body dissolved completely when we when we um when we get come to the real uh, ego which is our sarup through the bhakti when we our contamination our heart contamination is gone so what happens when our contamination is completely gone then then we we get rid of the gross body we come to the other body spiritual body and where are we located geographically meaning in the heart meaning okay wait now death death happens the soul leaves the gross body along with the subtle body we discussed that okay So when the subtle body is completely dissolved, where is the soul located? The soul is located outside the gross body. Join with the God. Uh, reunion in the spiritual with... world. In the spiritual okay. world, as soon as we enter, as soon as the subtle body is dissolved, it dissolves because we enter the spiritual world. Because in the spiritual world, only the spirit soul can enter. There is no space for any kind of subtle or gross body in the spiritual world. so along now we didn't discuss one very very important point when 
when death occurs, the soul and the subtle body leave the gross body and then the gross body is is uh, burnt or buried according to one's uh, religious beliefs okay but something else also leaves the body gross body what is that can you give us a mind. guess mind what's that kalpana mataji mind mind no mind is part of the subtle body so subtle when we say subtle mind body it is mind intelligence and false ego so soul is leaving along with the subtle body and super soul. super soul super soul exactly the paramatma very nice that's an excellent answer so super soul the lord is in the heart of every living entity as a super soul so even the super soul leaves the body so that's when the person is declared dead so when does the paramatma leave us or when does the paramatma leave the atma And the soul is never. liberated? No, when never. The soul is liberated, exactly. When we attain liberation or when we go to the spiritual world, that is when the Paramatma leaves the Atma. As long as we are in this material world, taking birth after birth from through the animals, birds, aquatics, even the worm in the stool or even the body of Lord Brahma, the Paramatma is accompanying us life after life after life after life after life after life. He never abandons us. The only time he leaves us is when we enter the spiritual world. Why does he leave us when we enter the spiritual world? Because, he, excuse me, because that's where he wants you to be. Exactly. That's where, yeah, you have reached your destination, isn't it? That's where he wants you to be. He's reached your destination. We don't require the guidance of the Paramatma anymore because there we are with the uh, with the Bhagavan feature of the Lord. Yeah, that's right. You reached your destination. That's, that's exactly what it is. Yes, exactly. So Paramatma leaves our side only when we have already realized the Bhagavan feature. We have entered the spiritual world. So we don't require the guidance. So as long as the guidance is required in this material world, the Paramatma is there with us. See how merciful the Lord is. And when we say my consciousness is pricking me, I cannot do this. What is that consciousness? It's the Paramatma who's guiding us from within. It's the Paramatma. That's our consciousness. But unfortunately, some of us stop listening to the consciousness. But he's always guiding us from within. Where is the soul and the super soul located? Where are they located? Heart. In, the body. Heart. in the core of the heart. Exactly, in the core of the heart. See, brain and heart are the two uh, very, very important organs in the body. But one can be brain dead, but he can still continue to live. But once the heart stops, the person is declared dead. So why? Because the soul and the super soul, they leave the heart. So that's when the heart stops beating. That's when a person is declared dead. But one can be brain dead and still continue to live. Why? Because they are not located here. They are located in the heart. So see, here Krishna is saying that we, that I have always existed. I will continue to exist. You have always existed. You continue to exist. And all these kings, which means the soul always exists. Don't, one should not think that after liberation, I will not, I will cease to exist. No, even after liberation, we continue to exist because the soul never ceases to exist. Even when we are one with the Lord, we continue to exist. We continue to maintain our individuality. Very, very important lesson, which very few people of the world population population can understand so this watermelon example we have given in the past just as how the seeds of the watermelon are one with the seed one with the fruit still they are maintaining their individuality they have not lost their individuality see here is a picture of vaikuntha plants we can see the lord here and all these uh, uh, these are all spirit souls the spiritual bodies and the, each one of them is rendering some service to the Lord. So even in the spiritual world, we are rendering service because our um, our uh, our original identity is that we are servants of the Lord. So we serve the Lord even in the spiritual world. You can see somebody is playing musical instruments for his pleasure. Somebody is plucking flowers for his pleasure. Somebody is going to offer him flowers. Somebody is fanning him with the chamara. Somebody is worshipping his lotus feet. Somebody is offering prayers. So like that, uh, each one of us has a unique service for the Lord in the spiritual world. 
Yeah, I saw Neha raising her hand. Taji, if we reach our dest destination, still uh, the soul continues to exist? Exactly, yes. It, that is exactly what Krishna is saying. That there will never be a time when you will not exist. The soul always exists, will always um, maintain its individuality. The soul never dies. It soul never, never dies. dies. Exactly. You never, you, it's not something that just disappears, vanishes, gone. No, it's not like that. The soul always exists. Is this the address of uh, Prabhupada, the Vaikuntha Lokas? Is this is where he is? Or the Goloka Vrindavan? Or? It's very hard to say where Prabhupada is. How can we answer that question? Oh, meaning when we go back to Godhead, we're going to go to Vekunta or Goloka Vrindavan? Where no, Prabhupada... where, now, now, see, where we go depends on two things. It depends on what we deserve and what we desire. We first, If we want to go to Goloka, we have to desire it and we also have to deserve it. If I want to perform a multi-organ transplant surgery, I should desire to do it. And I should also deserve to do it. No, I should have the qualification. Otherwise, who's going to allow me to perform the surgery? Now, I may have the qualification. I may have studied and I have got my degree and I'm qualified to do the uh, surgery. But if I don't desire to do it, is anybody going to force me to perform the surgery? Nobody can force me to do it, isn't it? So I have to deserve it. And I also have to desire it. Depending on these two factors, we will reach Goloka or Vaikuntha or heaven or hell, whatever. Mataji, what is the difference between Vaikuntha and Goloka? Okay, so in Goloka, Krishna is residing eternally as a 16-year-old boy. And in the Vaikuntha planets, the Lord is residing in his 400 Narayan form. So in Goloka, the residents of Goloka do not know that Krishna is God. So they enjoy more intimate pastimes with Krishna. But in Vaikuntha planets, one is aware that Krishna is God. So the relationship is more formal, more reverential. They are aware that Krishna is God. So the intimacy is a little less than Goloka. So it's God in, at home and God in office. The same person at home is, is so casual. No? He's playing with a child. The child is climbing on the back of the father. The father becomes a horse for the child. So the relationship is informal and there is more intimacy. But the same father when he's in the office and he's, he's with his with his workers over there, the relationship is more formal. It's more reverential, more respectful. So that's the difference between Goloka and Vaikuntha. I have another question. So when the, in this material world, when you're praying and serving the Lord, you know, we, we are praying and serving him as our Lord, right? Lord Krishna. So how does that change that after, if you desire to go to Goloka, now you will have pastimes with him as a, as a friend and you'll forget that this is the real God. This is the Supreme Lord. Yeah, so see, Srila Prabhupada said that when we begin our devotional uh, life, when we begin our spiritual journey, it's always reverential. But as we proceed more and more, as we advance more and more uh, in our spiritual lives, then it is revealed to us what is the rasa. What is the rasa uh, that we share with the Lord? So also depends on what kind of pastime you are attracted to. If you are attracted to uh, Narayan, because see, many people worship Lakshmi Narayan. They like to worship Lakshmi Narayan because they are attracted to that form of the Lord. Or they are attracted to Narsimha Dev, or they are attracted to Sri Sri Gauranitai, or they are attracted to Lord Ramachandra. For example, Hanuman is interested in uh, Ayodhya. He wants to go to that part of the spiritual world where Lord Ramachandra is residing. Uh, in, there is an Ayodhya in the spiritual world also. So Hanuman is not interested in going to Goloka. So depends on what form of the Lord you are attracted to, what is it that you desire, and of course what you you have to deserve it also. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, Aja Mataji, you have your hand raised. Uh, why all are in blue color, the men in the picture? They all are blue. Oh, because they have, remember there is one uh, liberation uh, uh, Swarupa. So the residents there, they have the same form of the Lord, but the Lord has certain distinguishing marks like the Srivatsa. Uh, he has a Srivatsa uh, mark and a curl, curl, a curl on his chest, which distinguishes him from all others, but they all uh, look like him. Uh, who all? The residents or uh, the souls who have attained liberation and they have they... attained the Vaikuntha. Oh, okay. Yeah. They all look like him, but he has a curve on the chest. That's how yes. we look okay, at the okay. uh, there, So there are, there are two two or three. I'm not too sure about that. But 
yeah the 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 curl on his chest and uh, shrivat samak is what distinguishes him okay so but the the females are all uh, white in color not blue right oh you are a very observant student <laughs> i don't know yeah they are uh, 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 here in the picture they appear golden complexion because uh, that's the complexion of shrimati radharani okay okay do we have any other questions can i ask one more question might be yes yes a stupid question but so i thought like lord krishna is the only purusha right so how come there are other souls that are males Oh, in the spiritual world, you have uh, male, female. You have um, cows. You have grass. You have trees. You have day and night also. Although time is absent in the spiritual world, but you still have them. So, it's both yes and no. For the pleasure of the Lord, they exist. To serve the Lord, they exist in different different so forms. So, how is one determined if he's a male or female? how it is determined again what one deserves and what one desires okay. desires is the main thing when you desire to be with krishna in a, in a particular mood then you deserve that particular mood you work hard for it and then you become a male or a female how you want, to... how you how was the desire that you want to serve krishna you want to serve krishna in the shantarasa then you become grass you become tree in spiritual world but you are still liberated you are still liberated or you want to uh, have your, your rasa with krishna as that of friendship or your rasa with krishna as that of conjugal so so uh, sorry uh, to interrupt you so did you mean that if even if we are a grass you we, we don't have any more uh, birth and death we are eternal there right okay correct 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 yes once you are in the spiritual world you will not come back krishna promises that in the gita that once you attain the spiritual world you remain there forever you will not come back here again so one may one should not think that oh i work hard and i follow the regulative principles and every day i i spend 2 hours chanting my 16 rounds and i go to the spiritual world but again if i come back then what is the use <laughs> so no once you go there you stay there that's krishna's promise mm -hmm. So why did we come here in the first place? If we were there originally, we were there. We said, then why why are we here in the first place? Is the next obvious question, isn't it? Because we desire to. Because we desire to. So what's the guarantee that once we go back, we will not desire to come here again? Because it's the oath of Krishna. It's the promise of Krishna. Oh oh, we still have free will, and but but Krishna says, once you become my devotee, once you surrender to me, once you worship me, once you follow me. once you are with me then you no longer be with material energy no no but the question is originally we were in the spiritual world when we were in the spiritual world originally of course uh, we were with him we were his devotees that's why we were with him in the spiritual world so why did we come down here in the first place because we had this desire to enjoy separately from him so krishna made this material world for us to enjoy and we and need him yeah and we did him as well but then he 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 made this and then we came here we did our little thing and now we want to go back to him permanently never to return back only to return back to serve him if as he pleases and so that's the thing yeah so what you're saying is correct we are here because we desire to enjoy independently from him now what is the guarantee that after we go back to the spiritual world again we will not desire to enjoy independently and come back is the question because we because one, once we become completely surrender completely surrender means no more enjoying separately from krishna no but when we were originally in the spiritual world we were fully surrendered right at that point when we were in the spiritual world we were fully surrendered otherwise we would have not been there in the first place because in the spiritual world there is no space for even marginal for such emotions Okay, Mata Ji, give it away. <laughs> okay, let's see anybody else. Is the question clear or no? Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Clear. I have a question. Yes. Why do souls get disorientated and don't reach to the destination? 
Ah, because Krishna has a servant who does her job to perfection. Her name is Maya Devi. So mm -hmm. Maya Devi perfectly executes her service. So she tests the determination of each one of us. So she is going to bring uh, in our path so many temptations and she is going to test our determination. Do, do you really want it? Do you really want Krishna? Look, I have this for you. So are we going to get distracted or, we, are, we, or are we going to remain focused? Are we going to choose Krishna or are we going to choose Maya? So if we choose Maya, then we get distracted. And if we choose Krishna, then we are on our way back home, back to God. So it's Maya Devi who distracts us to, to test our determination. Because we should really want it. We should really want Krishna. Just like how a mother's cry, I'm sorry, a child's cry for the mother. See, the child may be playing, the mother, mother is doing something else. But when the child starts to cry loudly, the mother will drop everything and come to the child. So our, our desire for Krishna should be like that of a crying child. But is there a guarantee that all the disoriented souls finally reach the destination or some of them just get lost? Yeah, some of them a technical question. can get lost if they never surrender to Guru and Krishna. If you, in order to go to your destination, we have to surrender to Guru and Krishna. Otherwise, there is no other way. But eventually we all, right? But after so many births and I was thinking like that maybe it takes longer time if you don't take in but one point of time you will learn God is everything and you will go back every yeah, one so, of us so that point of time when we will learn is only when we surrender to Guru and Krishna that unless we don't do that we will be taking birth again and again and again and again and millions and trillions and quarters in lifetimes the cycle exactly. is repeated again and again and again but eventually you will reach. At some point it will reach. If you surrender to Guru and Krishna, that if is always there. I, there's always because see, uh, see, when Kali Yuga ends, when Kali Yuga ends, what happens to those souls who are not yet qualified? Mahavishnu breathes in and all the material planets, along with all the souls who are still in the material world, everyone goes in the body of Mahavishnu. Now we are inside the body of Mahavishnu, but we don't deserve liberation because we didn't surrender to Guru and Krishna. So that doesn't mean that we are liberated. When he breathes out, again, we are in this material world. So for him, it's just one breath. And for us, it's quadrizillion lifetime. So eventually, if we have to go back home, back to God, we have to surrender to Guru. So if we surrender to Guru and Krishna, then we will go back. Okay. Otherwise, it's I going to it. happen. Thanks. Again, the cycle just continues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I got it. And surrender means we have to follow all the, the rules that are specified in the... In... Yeah, surrender means you follow the rules under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. Okay. If you don't have a guru, then that means you are find one. not surrendered. Okay. If you don't have one, find one. <laughs> no, Okay. Yeah, because you can surrender to Krishna only by surrendering to a guru. If you want to meet the president of the country, you have to go through a secretary. Can you just call the president and say, hey, I want to meet you? No, you have to go through the formality. So, guru is that person who removes it. See, we, we start our classes with Om Ajnana Timirandasya. No? What does that verse mean? Om Ajnana Timirandasya. Timi means darkness. Um, Ajnana means ignorance. So, so darkness is compared to ignorance. Om Ajnana Timirandasya, then Jnananjana Shalakaya. Shala, shala means uh, the torch, torch of light. And Jnananjana means Jnana or knowledge. So Jnananjana Shala, so knowledge is compared to light. Om Ajnana Timirandasya, Jnananjana Shalakaya. Chakshur Unmilitam. Chakshu means eyes. Unmilitam means to open. So the eyes are open and uh, brought, and one is brought to light to the, to the light of knowledge from the darkness of ignorance. And who is that personality who does that? Om Ajnana Timiranda Sir, Jnanan Jana Shalakaya, Chakshurun Militam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. So the spiritual master is that personality who opens our eyes and brings us from darkness to light, who brings us from um, uh, ignorance to knowledge. 
And to that personality, Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama, to that person, I offer my respects. That's what that verse means. So is that mantra uh, help us to uh, control Maya? Yeah, if you have to see in our Shastras, there are several hundreds and thousands of mantras, several are there. But if you want one mantra, which is the greatest of all mantras, which includes all other mantras, it's the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. There nothing can beat it. Okay, that, okay. that mantra can also, okay. Control yeah, that's the, Maha mantra. that's the Maha Mantra. It's the mantra of all the mantras. Okay. It's the mantra packed with uh, so much potency in Kali Yuga that in very small time, you can make great advancement. You're already chanting, right, Aja? Yeah, yeah, I'm chanting. Yeah. <laughs> I can see the difference, yeah. Ah, you can already see the difference. Very nice. <laughs> yes. Yes, Neha. If, uh, uh, our root cause of everything is desires. So uh, I don't think uh, Goloka Vrindavan may Maya exists. Karti hai. So no, in Goloka when... Vrindavan, there is no... No, no, no. In Goloka Vrindavan, there is no Maya. Maya is here in the material world. Yeah, so when we have conquered the desires and got liberated and when there is no maya in Goloka Vrindavan, root cause of desire is maya. Because uh, the root cause of desire is maya. So uh, there is, uh, if there is no maya, then we will not desire to come back. So what is the question? No, oh, the question right. for your uh, thing, uh, uh, the answer for your thing, that uh, why, what is the guarantee that we will... Uh, not get, come uh, again back to the... Uh... Ah, you're answering that question. Okay, okay. But then why we came here in the first place? So you are saying that there is no desire in the spiritual world. So therefore, we will not come down. But then why we came in the first place then? Originally, we no, no, no. There is, there is a desire in the spiritual world. There's a it, desire to serve Krishna. So, is is it, so why did we come to the material world? Is it to know the difference? Uh, to know is it to the know difference. The di Who wants to know the difference? The soul <laughs> wanted to experience uh, what it is without, uh, right? Uh, okay, without so, what is the, so what is the guarantee that after we go back, we will not we will not have that desire again? Krishna is wanted independence. Uh, now, the, uh, when we have uh, seen that we, we don't like the independence, we we'll feel that we don't want to come again. Ah, correct. Mm. Very nice. Because now we have already had the experience. So we don't want to do it again because we have learned our lesson. We have already mm. learned our lesson. Okay. So we were in the spiritual world, but at some point the desire came in our heart that I want to enjoy independently from God. I want to see what it is like to be God, what it is like to be the controller, what it is like not to be the servant because we are serving the Lord. So what it is like to be the master, to be served. I want to be the Lord of all that exists. That feeling we get known sometimes. So we want to be the controllers. We don't like to be controlled. So when we were in the spiritual world, the desire came that, okay, I want to see what it is like to be independent from God. What it is like to be the controller, not the control. So the moment that thought occurs, Boom, we are here in the material world. Because in the spiritual world, there is no space for such emotions. So here in the material world, then we realize that, oh, I'm not happy being independent from God. I'm not happy in being independent from my God, my father. So then we learn our lesson and then we go back. And now that we have already learned our lesson, we will not come back again. Just like how if you tell a child, don't touch this fire. The child out of curiosity will go and touch the fire, isn't it? But once the child burns his finger in that fire, will he ever go and touch that fire again? Will he do it again? Mm -hmm. He will not do it again because now he has learned his lesson. Okay. So we were there originally. We came here because of this, uh, this desire. But we will not. And once we go back, we will not come back again because we have learned our lesson. We have already burnt our finger in this material world. Okay. Okay. I think we should stop here. Let me see if we have more slides regarding. Okay, see here in this uh, photo, we have Goloka. Krishna is playing with his friends, Gopa friends. So here these personalities who have attained liberation, they don't know that Krishna is God. So they are enjoying more intimacy. And here we can see a soul. He's entering Goloka Vrindavan. 
from so this is it is at this point that the subtle body leaves the soul so here you have golok vrindavan you have vaikuntha planets which are like the petals of the lotus so golok vrindavan is like the whorl or the center part of the of the lotus and the vaikuntha planets are the uh, petals of the lotus and then we have the brahma jyoti or the light emanating from krishna's body so it is in this brahma jyoti that all these planets are floating and one corner of the spiritual world is the material world here you can see it's like a dark cloud in one corner of the spiritual world is the material world in this material world here is another picture of this dark cloud this is the material world this is goloka and these are the vaikuntha planets so in this dark cloud who is residing the first uh, incarnation of krishna in the material world who is mahavishnu mahavishnu is mahavishnu. Yeah. by his breathing he is creating universes so there are millions and trillions and quadrillion uh, universes each universe has 14 planetary systems so mahavishnu then expands and then we have garbhodakashay vishnu who enters into each universe so every universe has its garbhodakashay uh, vishnu then from the navel of garbhodakashay vishnu a lotus emerges and from that lotus comes out lord brahma you can see lakshmi devi is worshiping the feet of garbhodakashay vishnu actually her place of residence is his heart she resides here this is her residence her his heart but she chooses to come here out of her own voluntary service and then here you can see mahavishnu's expansion so these bubbles here they are all gold the universes are all golden egg shaped universes okay so within each universe you have garbhodakashay vishnu and then within each universe there are so many living entities so garbhodakashay vishnu expands as shirodakashay vishnu or the paramatma and he resides into the heart of every living entity right from the small ant up to lord brahma so here you have the three vishnus mahavishnu or karanodakashay vishnu garbhodakashay vishnu and shirodakashay vishnu so there are three vishnus so we'll stop here we'll continue in the next class of krishna so sanctions shrila prabhupada ki jai jai gita ki jai hari krishna mata ji hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna mata ji okay i have uh, i want to hari krishna mata ji uh divya budrani who regularly attends our classes she lost her father in law this morning he mm-hmm. and uh, i would uh, request you let's all chant the maha mantra three times and uh, dedicate it so that uh, the soul can have a destination for at least um, the next birth in a devotee family if not uh, definitely our desire is that he attains the lotus feet of the lord so let's chant थँक यू माताजी कोटी कोटी धन्यवाद प्रणाम श्री प्रभुपाद गीता की जय जी सनम माताजी की If she can, if she attains next birth, she can be in a Vaishnava's family. Or this, this life itself, she can go back to her. Jai, yes, uh, welcome. We welcome you all. Uh, thank Welcoming you for joining Ma. us, uh, Mata Ji, and thank let's you. all chant for her spiritual. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Ram. Hare Ram. Ram Ram. Ram, Ram. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Thank you very much Mata ji for joining us Thank you Mata ji koti koti dhanyawad pranam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna have a nice day Thank you Hare Krishna thank you Thank you very much Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna